A shocking bridge collapse in the East Coast U.S. city of Baltimore. The search for survivors is still underway. Hello, I'm Arnold Nido, and this is The Heat. Early on Tuesday morning, a cargo ship crashed into Baltimore's Key Bridge after the vessel lost power. The structure gave way instantly, sending cars and construction workers into the water below. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke about the collapse and had this to say. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge, and I expect the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. The search and rescue efforts continue as six people remain missing. CGTN's Poppy Imputing joins us now live from Baltimore. And Poppy, what's the latest there? Yes, Anand, uh, rescue missions are still ongoing as those six individuals are still unaccounted for. Officials say they were and are construction workers who were working on potholes on that bridge overnight when that cargo ship indeed collided into the bridge, collapsing it. Now, two people were already rescued from the water, one individual uninjured, another very seriously injured. But the search and rescue mission is is going to continue for the time being. Officials very clear that it's not yet a recovery mission, though I will say uh, that representatives from that construction company do say that they presume their workers are dead. But for now, that has not been confirmed by officials uh, here on site, Anand. Um, it also bears noting that the uh, National Transportation Safety Board is on site. They'll have of course, be undertaking uh, investigations into just what happened. Ahead of the collision, there was a Mayday call from that ship, which at least enabled officials to close the bridge from ongoing traffic. But unfortunately, those construction workers uh, could not be um, moved in, in time. But the NTSB will not yet be going onto the ship. It is still uh, moored there where it collided into the bridge. They need to make sure, officials say, uh, that the search and rescue uh, mission continues unimpeded, Anand. And Poppy, the collapse of this bridge, of course, is going to cause major disruptions. This is a very, very busy bridge. Something like 31,000 vehicles use it every day. Uh, what is the extent of the disruption that they expect there? What are you hearing? It's absolutely huge. As you mentioned, it's a major thoroughfare uh, going in and out of Maryland. But more importantly, the port of Maryland itself is now shut. And it is a major artery of cargo ships going to and from various countries. In fact, the cargo ship uh, that crashed into the bridge, uh, that was en route to Sri Lanka just beginning its voyage. So this part uh, of the country really is a huge thoroughfare, uh, huge cargo ships, billions of dollars worth of cargo passing through uh, every year. So that's going to cause huge disruption. Uh, nearby, in fact, we have an Amazon fulfillment center. Uh, we also have a FedEx center, BMW and Volkswagen have distribution centers here. So in terms of the fact that the bridge is inoperable and we don't know how long it's going to take to rebuild, but one can assume weeks and months to fully get that uh, transport way up and running again, as well as the fact, of course, that the Port of Maryland is now closed. So not only affecting cargo ships, but also uh, cruise ships. And as uh, President Biden uh, has noted, it is a really important um, rush in many ways to make sure that supply chain disruption is limited. Uh, but there is no getting away, uh, Anand, from the fact that for a while at least, the local economy and perhaps even more broadly, impacted by the closure of the port of Maryland and the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Anand. Thanks, Poppy. That's Poppy and Putting talking to us from Baltimore there. Well, to continue our conversation, let's bring in our guests. Joining us here in Washington, D.C., Adolfo Franco is an attorney and Republican strategist. From Maryland, Joseph Williams is a former senior editor at U.S. News & World Report. Also in the U.S. Capitol, Jackie Lukman is the coordinator for the Black Alliance for Peace DC, and Douglas Sloan is a Democratic strategist and principal at the National Capital Strategy Group. 
Welcome to all of you. Douglas, let me start with you. Um, you know, this, the collapse of this bridge, of course, it was an accident, but it's also focusing a lot of attention on the state of infrastructure in the United States. In fact, the Washington Post had a, had a headline which said, Baltimore's tragic bridge collapse is a test of America's leadership. Other major news organizations also focused on um, what this means for America's infrastructure. Um, President Biden did sign an infrastructure bill in 2021 in his first year in office. But do we still, or does the country still have a long way to go? I mean, how much of a priority is repairing the country's infrastructure? Repairing the country's, country's infrastructure is a major priority. And thank God that Joe Biden introduced this bill and was able to get it passed through Congress, a trillion dollar bill to fix the nation's infrastructure. I would like to note that uh, it wasn't that this bridge crumbled due to faulty or aging infrastructure, but it was hit by a, uh, a cargo ship, mm -hmm. uh, which may be able to take out any number of bridges. Uh, we don't have an a engineer on hand to determine uh, the structural integrity of bridges when it comes to dealing with a cargo ship, but it, it is a very real issue in this country. And it was, that is one of the reasons why Biden made it a priority to get this bill passed and to get people back to work repairing this nation's infrastructure is a huge priority. This nation's roads, bridges, and tunnels, and it's a great opportunity to get Americans back to work. And uh, it was a bipartisan bill, so both Democrats and Republicans are for it, and uh, it, it passed, uh, thankfully, with uh, uh, little issue. Uh, everybody saw the need to get it done, and although it, I admit it was a little contentious at first, but it is a real problem in this country, uh, given that you know we've been building bridges and roads for the past couple of hundred years. So uh, it's definitely something that we need to focus on and move forward with. Adolfo, uh, Douglas telling us there um, that this bridge didn't really crumble and collapse, uh, but the Federal Highway Administration described the state of this bridge as fair. Uh, rather than good. And that prompted a Republican representative from South Carolina, Nancy Mace, to pose this question. She asked, why, after the bill was passed three years ago, does the United States still have old bridges and old roads? Does she have a point? Well, I think she does have a point. Uh, first of all, to be fair, I think this is an accident. There's no question this is an accident. I don't think the bridge would have collapsed, even if it were in fair, in fair condition. Uh, but, however, I think it's a fair question. Uh, we all live, most of the guests here in the Washington, D.C. area, boy, I've just seen the infrastructure here, which is a major, major city in the United States, uh, deteriorate in the last three years. So I have no idea, again, the mismanagement generally of government and how these infrastructure monies have been, which has been controversial as well. A lot of the infrastructure money is questionable about infrastructure, uh, has gone to a lot of other pet projects. So we certainly haven't seen it in our metropolitan area, which is proximate uh, to Baltimore. Uh, secondly, uh, President Biden doesn't introduce bills in Congress. He's the president. He signs them into law. Uh, and the bills are introduced by members of Congress. Um, it was a bipartisan bill. However, I do think the big questions remain, whether it's this or other uh, issues that have arisen around the country regarding infrastructure of to Congressman, Congresswoman Mace's point, how much is being done and where is this being done and how wasteful, which government tends to be, are, are these funds and how are they being applied? And I think that's a very fair question because I don't think most Americans, this is just anecdotal on my part, I don't have any evidence of it, it's just empirical uh, evidence to support it. I don't think they're seeing their roads and their bridges being uh, repaired anytime soon. And we're talking about three years into this. I would have liked, last point, I'm glad that the federal government is stepping in to repair this bridge. I wish he would have used the same interest in East Palestine, Ohio, with a major accident in a more Republican part of the country where it took him a year as president to show up. Uh, and it certainly didn't offer that degree of help he's, he's offering Baltimore, mm -hmm. a Democrat-controlled city. Right. Judge Williams, you know, as we heard from our reporter there, uh, this port, the Port of Maryland, it's, it's one of the major links in the United States supply chain. In fact, it's the main U.S. port for the import and export of motor vehicles. It also provides 15,000 jobs. And looking at the figures here, 850,000 vehicles are processed through this port every year. So what is the kind of impact that we're looking at 
uh, not just on the economy of this region, but for the country and for the supply chain? Well, that's an interesting question, because among the first things I thought about uh, when I saw this bridge collapse and I saw the, 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 the videotape of the uh, tank of the uh, container truck, uh, container ship running into it, was the fact that this was going to cause a big hit to the U.S. economy. Probably not quite as big as COVID, but probably something similar. You might see a similar sort of shock in that you've got a major American port closed, like there was in the Port of Los Angeles when everything was shut down and goods coming in through there were, were delayed. It's going to cause supply chain disruptions. It's going to, particularly with auto manufacturers, I mean, you mentioned two manufacturers that have distribution points there, Mercedes-Benz and Volkswagen. So I think, it, though, you know, we, we might expect to see the price of cars go up. Uh, you might also expect to see more delays in Amazon getting stuff to, to and from people on the East Coast. Now, interestingly enough, that, that bridge, I've driven over it several times because it's on the way to my mom's house who lives um, in that part of the country. It's It was 1975, so it wasn't quite as old. It's, it probably was reaching the end of its life. But one of the things that also struck me about it was the fact that it withstood a hit back in the 1980s from a cargo ship. Uh, but the problem is the cargo ships have gotten bigger They've gotten heavier. They're laden with more stuff, and this bridge didn't keep up with it. I mean, I don't, I don't suspect anybody had any ideas of replacing the bridge because nothing like this had ever happened before. But in the era of like supermax uh, transport ships that are carrying billions of dollars worth of goods, tens of thousands of containers per ship, the infrastructure was not built for that in mind. Uh, certainly, ships could pass underneath it, but there were certain safety measures that kept it from collapsing in 1980 that's not going to keep it from collapsing in 2024. So we're going to see some economic disruptions. It might not be as big as COVID. There'll be, there will definitely be some ripples, uh, particularly in autos, probably in, in durable goods. How big it's going to be remains to be seen, but it's actually going to happen. Right. Jackie Lukman, I want to change direction right now. I want to turn to Gaza. We have been talking about that. The United States abstained at a United Nations Security Council vote uh, this week, uh, that vote calling for a ceasefire. The Israelis, in turn, responded to that United States abstention by cancelling a very high-level visit to this country uh, by an Israeli security delegation. We're also hearing some Democrats now openly calling the Israeli onslaught on Gaza a genocide. This is the uh, uh, progressive Democrat uh, in the Democrat in the uh, in Congress, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. She was speaking on CNN. This is what she said about using the word genocide. When we look at the precipice of what is happening with a forced famine of 1.1 million Gazans, where multiple governments, NGOs, and even officials within the United States State Department have stated themselves plainly that the Israeli government and leaders in the Israeli government are intentionally denying, blocking, and slow walking this aid in, and are precipitating a mass famine. So, Jackie, what do you make of the United States abstention and this sort of increasing restiveness that we're seeing among some members of the Democrat Party? Um, it's, it's interesting that uh, in Washington, what people are doing now, that they can't ignore what uh, uh, the apartheid state of Israel has been doing, not just since October 7, uh, but since <laughs> about a year or maybe a year and a half before 1948. Um, this kind of behavior from Israel, while it, it hasn't been consistently this intense, but Israel has carried out massacres, mass arrests for no reason, uh, imprisoning people without due process, which is kidnapping, um, and, and you know, denying food, denying water, shutting off electricity, all of this stuff, raping <laughs> Palestinian women, everything that the Israeli government has basically accused any Palestinian group, doesn't matter if it was the PLO, doesn't matter if it's Hamas, doesn't matter if it's another group that comes for it, doesn't matter. Israel is always going to claim that Palestinians are evil. They just want all Israelis dead. They've raped uh, uh, Israeli women. They've, they've killed Israeli children. And from this latest uh, uh, issue, we see that those things were not true. We knew some of us knew those things were not true the day they were being reported. Why? 
because the lies about wantonly killing children and mass rape of women and killing pregnant women, yeah. that's the kind of narrative the U.S. has always used mm -hmm. when it's gone somewhere and interfered in somebody else's government. But the reason U.S. politicians, at least some Democrats now, are uh, moving a little bit on their rhetoric, and, and it's if it's taking them, them this long to get used to what word to use for what they have to protect people from, I, I'm sorry, they're, they're absolutely useless, because it took 35,000 people for them to, uh, uh, to die, for them to come up with, oh, yeah, this is a genocide. I, I, I don't... What, what kind of progress is that when it takes you three months of an mm -hmm. ongoing... Okay, but Jackie, what do you make, of, what do you make of the U.S.? Before you can decide what words to use so you can craft some legislation mm -hmm. to stop it. But that okay. would only happen if the U.S. government wants to stop it. All right, what do you make of the fact that there seems to have been a big change in the U.S. government by abstaining uh, in, in previous votes at the U.N. Security Council? They vetoed these kinds of resolutions. Jackie? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize yeah. your story. Uh, the veto is because the United States government does not want to agree to a full and permanent ceasefire. Yeah. They do not want Israel <laughs> to stop bombing and murdering Palestinians. They, right. Joe Biden knows full well what is happening. Yeah. So this is why he claims he's going to build a port for temporary aid to yeah. reach them by the sea mm -hmm. without addressing the fact that Israel has been blocking the, uh, Gaza from okay. for decades. Right. I want to get... he says, yeah. oh, well, yeah, we're going to build this port, but we're still going to be solid partners of Israel. Yeah. We're never going to stop. Okay. Well, I know, what is that? Yeah, I think, jo Joseph Williams, you want to respond to that, don't you? Well, I mean, I think it was an assumption, uh, it's abstention. It wasn't blocking yeah. the, the resolution. I mean, I think that's a very important distinction that yeah. if it... It shows that the U.S. is moving away from the Israel's Israeli's position, and that the split is becoming very, very public. Yeah. Previously, the United States had vetoed those resolutions, and now they just kind of let it go by. But it yeah. was blocked by China uh -huh. and by Russia. So I don't necessarily think that it's uh, the U.S. locking arms with Israel as much as they did. I'm right. now I'm not suggesting uh -huh. that they're not still funding the Israeli uh, government and, yeah. and still giving them weapons, but there is daylight that's starting to appear, and I think that's pretty significant. Yeah. Douglas, we've I'm seen... Sorry. we've seen fast Sorry. That, that daylight is not... I'm sorry. That daylight is not wide enough. What's happening is not fast enough. Yeah. These people have known what Israel has been doing all this time. Yeah. And there honestly is no excuse for this country's government to continue dragging right. its feet. Oh. on stopping a genocide. Yeah, I want to get to Douglas. Douglas, uh, you know, for some time now, the conflict in Gaza has been having a significant impact on domestic politics uh, in the United States, especially in an election year. Um, we've seen President Biden is losing key support in some battleground states from Arab Americans, from Muslims in general. Um, do you think that this abstention um, could have been perhaps an effort by Biden to staunch that loss of support? One could only hope that Biden is that strategic. Uh, I believe that given <laughs> what we're looking at, uh, that I I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word genocide, but the fact that we have 40,000 people dead in Gaza and half of Gaza is made up of children uh, really speaks to what is going on there on the ground. Uh, in Gaza, and it, it's horrific. And now they're talking about famine, uh, that we're not able to get food there. They're struggling, that people are starving. So that really is an horrific situation. And I would think that uh, it just would weigh on America's conscience, on Biden's conscience, mm -hmm. to try to do something yeah. about it, to try to force Israel's hand to uh, pull back at this point, because it, it has really gotten out of hand. Adolfo, uh, Donald Trump, he also addressed the situation in Gaza. He was talking on the campaign trail. He said uh, that Israel has to be careful because it is losing a lot of the world, a lot of support. He said, you have to get it finished and get on with peace to get back to a normal life for Israel and for everyone else. This is a very, well, uncharacteristic statement from uh, Donald Trump. In the past, he's 
just expressed his unconditional support for Israel. But this is more measured. This is more tempered. What did you make of it? Well, here's what I made make of it is I think uh, despite sort of the perception I think people have of Donald Donald Trump, um, sometimes some people who don't know him, mm -hmm. he's he's quite uh, does not he has a good ear to the politics that was going on. He that is still a statement in support of Israel when he says. Uh, get the job done in a hurry. Mm. He is he is correctly perceiving that glo as, as this uh, substantial demonstrated, not only in the United States but globally, um, in Europe and other places where there has been support for Israel, that has been eroding and, and eroding rapidly. So uh, I think the message is this can't be uh, prolonged in terms of the operations, the military operations in Gaza without paying a steeper and steeper price. Mm. That's what I think. His, his message was. However, uh, what is clear here, and by Jackie's uh, position and my, my good friends Joseph and, 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 and Douglas, is let's talk about the politics of this. Uh, there's no question I think the Republican candidates for president and most Republicans in general are completely in line uh, with Israel. There is a schism in the, the Democratic Party and the progressive left. Yeah. I think it is a minority. Uh, with all due respect, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I don't think, and here's me defending Democrats, speaks for the majority of Democrats, mm. uh, and certainly doesn't speak, I think, for the administration. I think the administration would reject the word genocide, mm -hmm. uh, despite what she has said, and despite what some other extreme leftist Democrats mm -hmm. have said. Right. However, the reality is, I think this is a political program, is what you're asking, which is, if, if there's going to be any peeling off of support yeah. uh, for... Uh, Joe Biden, um, for on the, on the Israel issue, is going to come at Joe Biden's yeah. expense, uh, not at Republican expense, because most of those voters, 73 percent of Jewish voters vote Democratic, yes. as it is, uh, and the majority of Arab Americans vote Democratic, and the majority of these progressive leftists almost all vote mm -hmm. Democratic, and that's where the problem yeah. is. So that's we're not looking as Republicans to appeal to that group. Uh, we understand that group is gone, but that group may well stay home, right. and that is that is the that is the conundrum for the Democratic Party. I think this abstention mm -hmm. was an effort to have it both ways. Right. Not criticize Israel, not antagonize the majority of Democrats on the left, um, but also placate okay. to some extent even Jackie and other people here to say he's doing something. Yeah, no, he's not. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just, oh. <laughs> All right. I just have to say. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But Go ahead. I, I am a black woman whose people were brought here un, un, under duress and, yeah. and, and without our consent. Mm -hmm. And and we have watched the mass murder of our people, a hundred million Africans murdered by uh, uh, in, in the Congo, uh, by, by Belgium, by uh, uh, King Leopold. We, yeah. we never call that a homicide. We never call that a genocide. I, how? How? How do you not call a hundred million people yeah. murdered? How do you not call that a genocide? I don't understand why saving people's lives is a political issue that mm. we're talking about siphoning support from this group of people and, and appealing or appeasing that group of people. Oh. How about let's just save Palestinian people's lives? Yeah. How about let's just admit that Israel stole their land? How about well, starting with the fact that Israel is all right. a settler colonial? I, you know, we're going just to... Like yeah, okay, okay if listen, if I, can, I, will, I, will, I will get back to you. I want to get to Joseph Williams. Joseph, to I, want to, I want to get... I want to get to Joseph. Joseph, um, I want to continue with, uh, with Trump's candidacy. He's, of course, facing, he continues to face serious uh, financial issues. But he did get something of a reprieve this week, didn't he, when a court actually reduced the, the amount of the bond that he has to put up in that New York fraud case. Um, but he is framing all these charges, all these legal challenges, as election interference, as a political hit job by the opposition. Let's listen to some of what he had to say. We're going through this weaponization of our government to try and knock out somebody's political opponent. And so far, based on the polls, it's not working at all. So, I mean, is it working? Because Trump is ahead in six of these seven battleground states. Um, although, according to uh, a poll which was published in the Hill newspaper today, Biden is closing that gap, but Trump is still ahead. 
Again, uh, it's early, uh, although I, before I get started, I want to like tip my hat that we've had a rare moment of bipartisanship between me and Adolfo, which almost <laughs> never happens. So I want to mark this day on my calendar as a, as a, as a red letter day, and I think I owe Adolfo a beer or something. But <laughs> the, uh, the Trump's travails are, are a double-edged sword. I mean, we can talk all day about how he's using them, using them as fundraising devices. We can talk all day about how the, the, the MAGA crowd eats it up and how his rallies are just still people raging at the machine and raging at uh, the weaponization of government. Yeah. But we still have a presidential candidate of a major political party who is being held to account, arguably some say for the first time. Yeah. And that's going to make an impression on voters, particularly the longer yeah. it occurs. The longer these trials happen, the more he's seen going in and out of courtrooms. And we don't really know with any degree of certainty how these cases are going to go, whether yeah. or not they're going to break Donald Trump's right. way whether or not the government is going to get the upper hand at some point. Yeah. And uh, Adolfo and I have talked about this before, that there is a lot of time between now and then. Right. Six or seven months in politics is both a lifetime and no time at all. Yeah. Anything can happen. Okay. So I think the polls are going to shift. They're going to okay, ebb and flow before we get to November. Douglas, very briefly, I've got about a minute left. I mean, uh, if we look at Donald Trump, and how does one explain that a candidate that is facing dozens of charges, 91 charges, I think it is, is still able to lead in the polls? I mean, does this tell us that there is some kind of major disconnect between this bubble in Washington and the rest of, of the country? Of course. <laughs> uh, no, I, I really don't think so. We, we live in strange times. Uh, no one thought that Donald Trump was going to win in 2016, yeah. and then people thought he was going to win in 2020. Uh, I think that uh, people have to remember that th this is a replay of what happened in 2020, uh, Donald Trump against Joe Biden. And in order for Trump to win, he has to find a way to reach outside of his MAGA base yeah. uh, to independents, to moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans. And after January 6th and all the inflammatory rhetoric and uh, 91 different criminal charges under foreign indictments, yeah. that's just not going to happen. So uh, okay. despite what the polls are saying, I don't see how Trump pulls us off. OK, that's and we have to leave it there. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you again for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. of business is to bring value. Business activities in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. reach consumers globally. Trade, manufacturing, energy, high-tech, real estate, consumption. We give an expanded view on global business and how it covers, influences, or relates to the whole world. Global business, only on CGTN.